good evening. Hi. Tonight, tonight I get to welcome you again, Dennis, to, to our viewers, and we're looking forward to carrying on from what you started before. You spoke more about marriage, and now you'll speak to us more about spirituality. And the role of the Nakshatras, their involvement in spirituality. I know that many people, myself included, are, are waiting to hear your words in this fantastic topic. So please share with us your wisdom. And I can guarantee you that Anurada and I will ask questions as as they come up and i will do it from the western perspective and anurada will do it from a more correct perspective uh, i beg to differ over here uh, phyllis it's uh, the perceptive is different but not correct or correct i think it doesn't matter we are all humans at the end of the day so it's the perceptive that matters doesn't matter where uh, from where as well, long as we can share with our viewers so they have an understanding of the significance and Dennis okay. that's what we're looking for from you so please that's be great. our guest both again <laughs> New Year the thank you time. and I you know it would be nice to share Anurata for you to share with uh, the viewers about today the puja today and honoring that I was really curious when you were describing that. That would be valuable. Yeah, to put it in the present, because this is such a powerful day. Could you mention a little bit about that? Sure, sure. I would love to. Uh, today is uh, the Tej. Um, today is the third day of the Navratras. And on this auspicious day, we worship Shiva Parvati in the form of Isha, Isar and Gauri, especially in the northern part of the country, uh, in India, uh, we worship them as Isar and Gauri. Uh, Shiva and Parvati have their own set of trials and uh, tribunals, you know, in this in their married life. But uh, nevertheless, they're very constant in their love for each other. So every young girl in this in uh, in that part of the country, at least, uh, for starting from the day of the Holi, uh, worships uh, Shiva and Parvati for this 16 days. And uh, they, uh, they always want, they, their most desired wish is to get a good husband. And the married ladies also, they have an option of worshipping for 16 days or just on this day to reinforce their love for their husband and to ask for a happy and a blissful married life as Shiva and Parvati have had for so long, from eternity till eternity. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's, in, it's uh, fascinating mm -hmm. in terms of spirituality that I think one of the most challenging and rewarding spiritual paths is marriage or relationship. And uh, I think that's why a lot of times saints have chosen not to be householders because it's so, you know, it is. It's such a challenging path. I thought I would talk a little bit about Yogananda tonight, who's my guru and my, that lineage of Sri Yukteswar, who was a great Jyotishi, and Yogananda, and Jesus, and Krishna, and uh, Babaji. But talking about spirituality and marriage and, and choosing to either have a life of, as a celibate or a monk or a nun or a householder, uh, Yogananda, you know, I don't know if you know the story, but he was, you know, he was a great, great avatar, and he lived from uh, 1893 till 1952, and he was one of the, uh, like Vivekananda and other great saints, he, were, he, was a, he was one of the great saints that brought basically Hinduism and Vedic sciences to the West, and he was told by his local astrologer in his community uh, when he was a teenager, I think that he would be married three times and twice a widower and if you look at his chart it is somewhat challenged the Venus is in Scorpio uh, even though it's in the fourth house which is a good position for it housewise still it's still somewhat of a challenged aspect and uh, Saturn rules his seventh house it's in the second which sometimes they say in the in the uh, in the text that the person will have several marriages 
So anyway, the story goes is that Yogananda took his chart and he wadded it up, his Vedic chart, and threw it into a fire. And he said, the seeds of my past karma cannot grow in the fires of divine wisdom. Okay. But on three different occasions, his family tried to get him married to three different women. And he refused because he wanted to be married to divine mother. You know, mm. so it's interesting, these different paths that we take and what our karma is work out in terms of uh, our spirituality. So to me, Yogananda, he represents uh, some of the things that I look at, look for in a chart, you know, in terms of spirituality. Mm. Um, and, you know, we were talking about the, the nakshatras, the quality of the nakshatras. And it's interesting how even some of these most fierce, you know, as you said, ugra, or, uh, or some of the harder aspect of terms of qualities of the nakshatras, sometimes are in the great saints' charts. Uh, for example, Yogananda was Leo rising with moon and Leo, both in Magha, which is an ugra or fierce nakshatra. And he was actually, uh, he was very much, even though he was a Brahmin, he was also a kshatriya. He was a warrior. Uh, according to some people, he was Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. And he had lived also, according to some legends, uh, William the Conqueror. He was involved in that lifetime. So he was a spiritual warrior. So maybe the Ugra served in that way. And then, of course, that nakshatra as Ashwini, as Mula, or Ketu ruled nakshatras. And as we know, Ketu is the Moksha Karaka planet, the planet of spiritual liberation. So sometimes we'll see... K2 nakshatras, I would say, uh, in charts of saints, you know, even though, again, Ashwini, of course, is uh, Lagu or much more uh, uh, easier quality to work with. But we'll see sometimes, uh, again, these qualities of K2 being prominent in the chart or nakshatras ruled by K2. And in Yogananda's case, you know, he had, like I said, both the moon and rising in, in Magha. Uh, you know, another great saint, modern saint, uh, that has her, his moon in, actually, in Mula, the K2 nakshatra, is the Dalai Lama. Uh -uh. And yet, you know, both of them had very intense lives. I mean, you know, the Dalai Lama in terms of what happened in Tibet, and uh, Yogananda, you know, bringing Vedic sciences to the West and all that he had to go up against, you know, in the 20s and 30s and 40s. So... I see K2 is sometimes very important, and uh, as we know, Jupiter is the guru planet, and um, sometimes it'll be, of course, usually there'll be a prominent Jupiter. Yogananda had Jupiter in the sign of Pisces, uh, in, in, it's in its own sign, Bakshet. Okay. But um, one thing I wanted to say to your viewers is also, is that the and Rao taught me this, was that quite often he said he found in charts of saints a challenged Venus, a debilitated Venus, or a Venus that was very challenged or difficult. And what he said was, and, and that's true, and I think in Swami Shivananda's chart, he has Venus in Virgo. And Yogananda, as we mentioned, Venus in Scorpio, and the ruler of Mars in the eighth house. So there's challenges with the Venus. And what Kan Rao shared with me is that in saints' charts, Quite often it's that way because it forces them to find happiness beyond this world. They won't find full happiness here. And the Venus being challenged will, will push them to find more of the divine romance, maybe a deeper level of love. So, this fits the bill like a glove. This fits the bill like a glove because... Uh, then you move beyond the material, you move beyond the mundane, and you move on to a level which is so, so different from the, mon uh, you know, from the material world. Uh, this is beautiful. So if the Venus is afflicted uh, or challenged, then we have a chance of a spiritual development for a person. Yeah, and it may be that the person may be better off being, a, you know, being brahmacharya, you know, uh, it's, you know, because of the, the challenge Venus, it could indicate, like Yogananda was predicted, you know, he would be married three times and twice a widower. And, you know, so the idea is that sometimes the karma could be circumvented by not choosing 
to, to live the life of a, of a householder. So it's interesting how these different twists and turns and how we can really even, you know, this is one of the things I think is very important about spirituality and astrology is that even though from the ego point of view, something can seem very bad or difficult or, you know, affliction or malefic. From the soul point of view, sometimes the very thing that we think is the most terrible in our chart may be the saving grace. We were talking about Jeshta, for example, that nakshatra and Gandanta in the last few degrees of Jeshta and being very, usually a very difficult placement for any planet, really. Um, but yet, if one learns humility and learns to let go of arrogance and pride, that you know, you were talking about your dad, your father having that as a rising sign, and how he was very humble. So it's interesting how these different aspects in our chart uh, can really teach us humility, uh, the challenging aspects quite often. I mean, if you look at Hitler's chart, he was a very powerful kind of Lord Ravana type of character, and he had what, sun, exalted, Mars and Aries, you know, Moon and Sagittarius, all these great yogas in his chart. And just because something's powerful doesn't mean it's powerfully good. And just because something difficult doesn't mean it's necessarily, from the soul point of view, necessarily has to be held as a negative thing. So this is where I think with spirituality, we have to be a little careful just to think in terms of it has to be this kind of glorified Jupiter or this or that, which is still lovely to have, of course to have that in your chart. But sometimes if you look at saints charts, they're very, very challenged. Yeah. Yes. So, interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, here I would just like to ask you saying that uh, we need to move away from uh, seeing the chart as we see for a material, when we are doing it for a spiritual reading and when we are doing it for a material reading, there are two different uh, ways of reading the chart altogether. Otherwise, we'll get uh, highly mixed up and confused. Is that it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I like, you know, Phyllis knows Hart Defoe was, who to me is one of the greatest Vedic astrologers alive. And Hart, one of the things he'd often say in his classes is, from what point of view do you want to look at the game from? Mm -hmm. so uh -huh. this is a little tricky it's not so black and white because you know again um, something that um, it may be from the ego point of view very challenging may be a gift if the person learns humility and that was the other thing Kay and Rao said about sometimes a debilitated Venus or challenged Venus it doesn't just have to be a Venus in Virgo but say Venus combust the Sun or other aspects of Venus is challenged uh, is is that again the person if, it, if they learn to work with it, will be very humble. And he said that actually about Nietzsche planets just in general. Planets that are, are debilitated, um, that quite often the, the grace with them is the person would, 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 would be humble. That could be the beautiful thing about a planet that, that was, you know, from our, from our vantage point looking really difficult. It's not that there isn't the challenges that come, because there is. I mean, it's not... We don't want to sugarcoat things and sure lead a person off a cliff, you know, either. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, we can sometimes, you know, you can paint such a negative picture. I think that we have to be careful as astrologers, you know, because we can paint such a negative picture that the person will be overwhelmed. So I know we've talked about this in the past is always, I think, always to focus on the strengths in the chart. And, um, of course, you know, with moksha, with spiritual liberation, the 4th, 8th, and 12th houses are considered moksha houses. And K2 is moksha karaka. So these things are generally, you know, not the easiest houses to work with, you know, especially in the 12th. And yet, maybe it's what pushes the person towards God realization is that, you know, some, it's sad, but generally the ego doesn't want to change unless it's suffering. Definitely. That's what I was going to say. Definitely. The advantage of a debilitated planet or the opportunity to have some pain in our lives. Because how else do we get to know ourselves? Because when it's going good, who wants to look inside? 
Well, you know, uh, Carl Jung, the famous psychiatrist, psychologist from Zurich, from Switzerland, said that, um, how did he put it? The birth of consciousness does not occur without pain. Now, granted, I think we could learn from healthy pleasures. We don't have to just, <laughs> we make it harder. This is the other kind work. We, have to, yeah, we don't have to make it so tough, but... You know, usually the ego is a little bit like a coconut. It kind of has to be cracked open for the umbrella, for the divine nectar to come out quite often. So. At least once. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, like, what, oh, oh, but, uh, but Sri Krishna has repeatedly broken the egos of his loved ones. The moment they move on to a high scale, especially Narada, the moment he starts vibrating on an ego, his me ego starts vibrating, he, especially the ones he loves, you know, he's broken their ego because he says it's either your ego or me which can dwell in your heart. So you have to choose. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't, for his loved ones, he doesn't give them a choice. He says, no, I want to be there. But for the others, definitely when we are, ego, when our ego is broken, we know that he's just round the corner. He's residing there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I always think of ego. That's, that's a nice <laughs> to remind people. <laughs> yes. So which, uh, which uh, nakshatras are good for breaking of the ego when they are vibrating? Well, that's what I was thinking. Thinking maybe you know the uh, the K two ruled nakshatras have their place in that way. You know, of course, Ashwini is more more easier to work with, but uh, you know, even there, it's in the sign of Aries, ruled by Mars, so it still has its edge to it. But um, you know, like I said, Magha, you see, like even uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, I think he had his moon in Magha as well. Can't remember if it was sun or moon, but. Um, uh, so I think these, these K2 ruled nakshatras, you know, can be strong. Of course, to me, you know, um, Usha, you know, and Punar Vasu are two of the nakshatras that I find too and strong in the charts of saints. I think uh, Ramana Maharshi, the great uh, Vedanta Advaita teacher, had Punar Vasu rising as his rising nakshatra. Okay. Uh, so... You know, the Jupiter ruled nakshatra is generally, you know, and, you know, be connected with, uh, with uh, I think can be connected, of course, with spirituality. But it's interesting, you know, too, the, the, uh, the Saturn ruled nakshatra is, you know, Pushyan and Aradha. Mm -hmm. and, uh, those nakshatras ruled by Saturn, uh, they seem to bring great spiritual growth because Saturn, Shani, is a little bit like you were talking about with Krishna. He, mm -hmm. he the ego open. He wants to, uh, you know, wants to, you know, put things in their proper perspective in terms of that we are not on God or Goddess's train. You know, we are on their train. They're not on ours. Mm -hmm. So I always think of ego as edging God out. <laughs> Goddess. That's a so, good one. That's a real good one. Ego is edging God's, uh, God out. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, you've told uh, about the Jupiter nakshatras having uh, and Saturn nakshatras. Saturn nakshatras, you've said that uh, they are more into breaking the ego like that of the, like that of your uh, Ketu nakshatras. But Jupiter nakshatras, would they not be more in terms of Gyan Yoga or, uh, you know, raising the level of your uh, knowledge, spiritual knowledge, instead of breaking of the... Uh, your right. ego, it's more into terms of giving you that knowledge, divine knowledge to progress further. A good point. It's kind of like the, uh, the difference between um, gentle grace and fierce grace. They're both grace, you know, but sometimes with Saturn and, you know, some of these uh, other planets, they bring a little bit more of the fierce grace, where Jupiter is, by and large, because it's a natural benefic, it wants to bring a little bit more gentle grace. You know, so kind of the way I hold it a little bit in terms of a dichotomy there. Um, but, you know, it's interesting that when I look at each of the nakshatras, I see the path of enlightenment coming in different forms. I mean, we were talking about Bharani, which, you know, is considered somewhat of a challenging nakshatra ruled by Lord Yama and Chitragupta. And there's a connection strongly with kind of death. And 
death rebirth connected with that nakshatra. So it's again, it brings brings uh, spirituality, but a little bit usually more through the life of hard knocks. You know, the story is that Lord Yama, when you die, when you go to the other side, uh, you're taken into kind of like a projector room. And Chitragupta is with is the aid of Lord, Lord Yama, and you review your life. You take your, your life is reviewed, and you look and see the good, the bad, and the ugly of what you did in this lifetime. And hopefully, you know, you get the lessons that you came here to learn. I mean, it's not to be judgmental or moralistic about it. It's just that quite often when we're taken to the other side, we have to look at the places where we miss the mark. You know? And how many people talk about this, you know, that have had near-death experiences? You know, mm-hmm. and usually it's I, I had I went through a near death experience back in uh, it was in 2007, and my experience was very much like that was was taken and and had to review and look at uh, things in every little speck. You know? uh, <laughs> <It's easy. laughs> is it is it scary? Is it scary? It's a personal question. Is it scary when you review your life? You said you have a... Uh, you know, uh, no, it was, it was humbling, you know, probably. It was painful in the sense that, you know, because uh, when you look and see where the places where you miss the mark, which actually that's what sin actually means. Sin, it's just missing the mark. It's like you're trying to hit a target, you know, and you miss the bullseye. It's not like you necessarily miss the whole target. You just maybe you know, maybe did something to hurt someone's feelings or something, you did something insensitive. So it's looking at those things, you know, it doesn't have to be a big thing, like you murdered someone or did some terrible thing. Sometimes it can just be, you know, things that we didn't, where we weren't in integrity. So my experience was looking at those things. And it was, it was, it was painful, but also it was very beautiful at the same time. So it's strange, very strange. So you can actually feel, uh, you know, you, you can also tell yourself this, I could have easily done or this, I could have easily uh, overlooked or um, let go of. Why did I not? This, this, does this feeling come up? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, my experience is, is that when we, when we go to the other side, we're going to be asked two fundamental questions, much more than two, but two of the biggest ones is how much did we learn? And how much did we love? And, uh, you know, I think the review of your life is more just to make sure you got the lessons that you came here to learn. And, and that to me, the astrology chart is a reflection of that, of the lessons that we came here to learn, the karmas that we want to, you know, kind of clear up, clean up, so to speak. And also to, um, you know, to learn, you know, of course, new things and grow. And like you said, to experience more of the expansion and growth that sometimes Jupiter and some of the other planets bring more easily. Uh, so what about the set of planets of Rahu? What would, uh, sorry, a set of nakshatras ruled by Rahu? What would Rahu uh, denote and how would it teach its lesson to uh, spiritually? Mm-hmm. You know, I think with the Rahu ruled nakshatras, it's, and it's true for everyone, but I think with the Rahu ruled nakshatras, uh, because Rahu is a strong planet of desire, and it can pull us into this aspect, this, that aspect, that it becomes even more important dealing with Rahu to have a, a really strong sadhana or daily practice. And that Rahu almost, um, to, to kind of hold it in check, so to speak, to balance the energy, much more. I think when more effort is needed to be to be uh, given when Rahu is present, you know, like a Dasha or Bhukti or uh, the Moon. I find the, the Ardra is probably more the most challenging of the three, you know, uh, Rahu nakshatras, but it's also one of the most brilliant, you know, intellectually. Uh, Adra Nakshatra, uh, I find, is the one that imparts its duality to uh, to our uh, Gemini, the entire sign, because it has it has it is 
on both levels shiva can is the householder and yet you would not find a yogi like shiva so again adra nakshatra is beautiful as you just said but then the energy is to bipolarity is so much common because of uh, this dual, dual nature so how do you overcome that that of rahu when especially when there's a transit which is not good over that nakshatra how can you overcome that well you know rahu as you as you were mentioning of that nakshatra ardra is ruled by uh, is connected with rudra you know who of course is the ancient form of shiva so i think part of it is to learn to work with one's temper and with anger and being able to work with that energy so that it doesn't it's not destructive so that the uh we could say a person learns to be assertive rather than aggressive and uh sometimes with uh ardra uh again i find it's, it's interesting because it is it is connected i found it sometimes it's connected with death and dying so sometimes people with strong ardra have the capacity to work in hospice to hospice work and to work with people that are going through um death or transitioning It doesn't have to be necessarily just physical death but to uh, to me ardra is um it's interesting though you find it prominent in a lot of great computer programmers you know in terms of vedic uh, astrology programmer you know i think I think Andrew Foss has it rising and Neil Bonder, you know, Frasher's Light and Sri Jyoti Star and I think there was somebody else too that had a prominent ardra uh that was brilliant, you know, in terms of mathematician, you know, and statistician and and a computer programmer. So, uh I find ardra seems to be really good for the study of astrology. Uh so maybe that would be a way to work with it. But I think the main thing with with ardra and swati and shatabisha is the again real strong sadhana that to ground that energy because rahu as you know is a vata planet or vata planet so it will tend to create more derangement in the mind so the person has to really work on i think on grounding with the air sign you know they need to have as i always say everybody talks about having an out of the body experience <laughs> really what you have it's having in the body experience <laughs> get out of your head and into the body so maybe some kind of physical practice like hatha yoga or something like that that helps to ground them to keep them in the body in in a good way so yeah. that was a real good one so we really to grounding is very important so can we do research you know these people if they get into research or uh, do some physical work which helps them maintain the balance otherwise the rahu can play upon the mind a little too much correct yeah you know one thing there's a actually a book it's very interesting called earthing and it's it's in the book it talks about the importance which a lot of us don't do especially if we live in a colder region but walking barefoot walking on the earth mm-hmm. just allowing divine mother you know to absorb our stress and to ground us into the earth and it, so often we're well you know not so much in the indian culture but a lot in the western culture we're always wearing shoes or socks or we're you know not touching the earth you know with our feet you know Mm-hmm. so there's the whole uh lack of grounding but i think one of the things i always talk about with clients especially if there's more vata problems is is about um what are they doing in terms of exercise how are they staying in the body so that would be important and to me the best exercise bar none is the one that the person will do so <laughs> you know, i mean it could be walking it could be whatever it doesn't have to be necessarily aerobics or whatever but uh still uh i don't know if that answers your question but uh, uh no, it does. i think grounding is so important so important because we can sometimes kind of spiritually bypass things and uh i think we have to go we can go vertical you know in terms of higher but we also have to go horizontal and that horizontal is the grounding in the world to be as Jesus said in the world but not of it 
be able to have the horizontal strength and then also the vertical. Yes. So uh, I, uh, this one point here that I wanted to ask was, so people who have Rahu energy in excess, if they want to spiritually progress, can they work with, uh, you know, children or an orphanage or things like that? Because it is a very strong grounding force in itself. Yeah, that's a good idea. I, th I would say that's a good idea. And, um, you know, Rahu also, uh, according to Dr. David Frawley, which I found and his wife Shambhavi, I found this to be true, is that Rahu has a connection with Durga. Yes. So some kind of Durga, <coughs> or mantra for Durga could be really good for working with that Rahu energy because it is kind of a Kshatriya energy. It's a very powerful energy. And, uh, you know, again, it needs to have some kind of uh, uh, containment. Yeah, and containment. And maybe Durga can, she has that capacity to, to bring that containment. It's a good word. Okay, uh, now I'm just moving one by one about the energies of the nakshatra. So the next in the line would be the sun, the divine force of the sun, our <coughs> Kritika. Uttara, uh, Uttara Palguni and Uttara Ashara. So how do these uh, nakshatra play out in the divine role of uh, our spiritual energy or spiritual well, so, um, I think it's in the uh, Atharva Veda the list of the nakshatras actually starts with Kritika, you know, the first sun rule mm -hmm. nakshatra. Yes. And Barani is the last nakshatra, which would be make sense because Barani is connected with Lord Yama, death. Um, so to me, uh, Kritika, as we know, the deity is Agni, god of fire. And so to me, with uh, that particular nakshatra, I find um, it's really good for them to do something with that actually, because Kritika means the flame, that it can be really good for them to always have a candle lit or, uh, you know, of course, incense. Something, something burning uh, can be very helpful. And connections with Agni. Uh, I, sometimes I think of Agni and I, I go back to, to the Saraswati civilization, the Indus Valley civilization, which is where modern-day Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Kashmir, northern India is. And that Agni was, was one of the ancient Vedic gods that was really revered during those times of ancient Saraswati or Indus Valley civilization. So I connected up sometimes with people that have prominent Kritika. I'll talk about that particular civilization and uh, how even though, and it's actually interesting because that the next nakshatra, Rohini, is ruled by the moon is also very much connected with the Indus Valley civilization. Okay. And, uh, so that nakshatra to me is again strongly I connected up with Agni and talk about the connection in that way. The um, Uttara Falguni I find is connected I call it the star of patronage because it's connected with with really being of service to others and especially because you know the last three Padas of that are in Virgo. So Virgo is a very service oriented. So sometimes it working in the social work field or working in humanitarian work that helps to be of service to others is a good, strong spiritual path. Maybe more a little bit, a little bit of a karma yogi in a sense. That's exactly the uh, word that I was going to use that these people will be more of a karma yogi to move towards their spiritualities. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And then, you know, when we think about Uttara Shada, you know, ruled by the sun, it's also, uh, you know, the Uttaras are all uh, connected with more mature kind of energy. And I think of that nakshatra as also uh, connected of a person that reflects our ability to go beyond prejudice, to see all people as one, you know, sometimes called the universal star. Oh. And, uh, Again, most of it, most of the last three padas fall in Capricorn, so a Saturn ruled sign. So again, it's a, it's a strong, and again, there's a strong aspect of kind of a karma yogi aspect with that nakshatra as well, I think. And it's very much of wanting to be of, of service to humanity in the, in the sense of seeing all people as one. 
this is a very beautiful observation and is this is a very beautiful mm-hmm. observation where you say that they move beyond you know demarcating people as everybody does being a snob is something that they do not like and they move they it's like god finding god in everybody it's beautiful an observation yeah i think uh, it was martin luther king that had the sun or the moon in uttara shada you know and he you know is able to see all people as one you know and bring about peace through through the unity and the diversity so yeah I think even Deepak Chopra, for example, even has uh, something strong in Uttara Shada, if I remember correctly. Mm. Okay, so, so, and now we move on to the moon nakshatras, because the moon is an important, uh, as important as it gets, because it's the husband of all the 27 nakshatras. So, uh, Rohini, then we have Hasta, and we have uh, Shavana. So how would they play out their role in spiritual development? Well, Rohini has been connected a lot with Sri Krishna. You know, according to B.V. Raman, he felt that, that uh, Krishna had both the moon and rising in Rohini. And as I was mentioning, that, that nakshatra, I connect up a lot with the ancient Indus Valley civilization as well, because Rohini, you know, means the red one, which is connected with the goddess energy. And, you know, the Indus Valley was a very much a goddess type of culture. And actually, some of the ancient uh, artifacts they found there, one of them had a picture of Durga, you know, being worshipped by Shiva. And uh, it seemed to be a very strong, or Rudra. You know, at that point, Shiva was more known as Rudra. So the idea is, again, that nakshatra is very much, um, I would say, connected with that ancient civilization the really and strongly the honoring of the feminine because you've got the moon as well as you know rule i mean that nakshatra ruled by the moon excuse me and then it in taurus taurus ruled by venus so there's a real strong divine feminine energy and i think you know as you know if we don't honor the feminine we're in deep trouble (laughs) (laughs) very deep trouble (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> no, in Sanskrit, we do have a saying which says the Yatra Pujantinari Tatra Vasate Deva, that the place that you worship uh, the lady, the god, uh, the lady or the feminine, that is the place where the gods reside. Yeah. So to me, I, I see Rohini is that it represents that really, really strongly honoring of, of, uh, of Divine Mother. And again, um, the Indus Valley to me was such an amazing civilization because they, when they, it wasn't even discovered until 1930. And the archaeologists, when they uncovered it, like Mahinjadara and Harappa and some of those ancient cities, they could find no weapons, no spears, no swords, no, you know, it, it was a peaceful realm, you know, and a, a realm of, of a civilization that was based on spirituality agriculture and arts and crafts and jewelry and you know the finer fine arts and beauty Uh, so i think of rohini in that way the the need to honor beauty arts uh creativity uh carl jung again who i you know has a strong influence on me as a psychologist um he said that one of the chief causes of neuroses was block creativity And so that is also maybe one of the chief causes of our spiritual, uh, how would we say, our our inability to experience our spirituality is blocked creativity. So Romani represents to me this creative conduit of energy that's so strong. I think with Hasta, you know, I I always think of Hasta and I think of um, the importance of writing. You know, of course, hasta means the hands. So it can be with the hands. But I, I, I think of hasta, and I think of, um, I don't know, like I see someone that needs to journal, you know, needs to commit their thoughts to paper, bring, bring the mind down into the earth, into the Virgo, into the physical world. So it's, it's uh, so much like, um, can we say, again, a grounding power? But yeah. 
so it's also uh, intellectual uh, you know when people have this when there's a bad transit or that i can't call it a bad transit but particularly difficult transit happening on this mm-hmm. nakshatra so if mm-hmm. and somebody's not natal uh, planet is getting afflicted so mm-hmm. moving towards uh, spirituality would be towards writing and things like that as you say yeah i think i think that's one way to um to really i think a process of um of journaling is a, can be a very powerful um uh, powerful spiritual practice uh, and i find with hasta because it's ruled by the moon and it's in again mercury sign of virgo it can be very mental so again the need for the grounding there and thank god it is an earth sign so it helps to bring it into into some form but i think it's like bringing one of the things about journaling and writing thoughts down is it takes it out of the mind and brings it into the form so you don't have to be ruminating about it it's there you know you've written it down it's like it's like if you're if you have 10 10 things to do for the for the day you know write them down to have your to-do list uh you know it's probably a good a good appropriate way to work with it so you don't have to be thinking oh, what am i supposed to do today but i think yes. actually what we what we need besides a to-do list is a to be list like what <laughs> we want to be you know, rather than do we, we need to work on so maybe that's the, maybe that's hasta they need to develop a to be list <laughs> that yes so, but it's, it's a, as you know david nakshatra and good good nakshatra i think to um to uh to have prominent in the chart it's interesting because jupiter's retrograding back into hasta you know yes. and then we'll, we'll station in hasta you know uh, what june 9th or so so that'll be interesting maybe it'd be good for any of us writers you know that are having writers block maybe it'll help us to move forward you know may yeah. help some countries too yeah hopefully it'll bring some betterment for all of us And then um Shravana to me is one of the of course I'm biased I love Shravana because one of my main teachers Dr. David Frawley has his moon there and uh Shravana you know is the star of learning so there is a gyan aspect to Shravana very strongly of path of wisdom of knowledge of learning and there are pers- I think this is true for all of us like so but Shravana particularly they need to always be learning from birth till death if they're not learning they'll feel like they're dying you know and to me it's a very refined nakshatra uh so you see it in the charts great scholars uh particularly i think sometimes spiritual scholars so it's again one of those nakshatras that um uh, probably very um very good for enlightenment and as you mentioned the last what uh, four signs of the zodiac are connected or with the sattvic or sattva Mm-hmm. Uh, so again Shravana falls in that uh that last so. uh so now we have covered uh moon also so can we move on to mars i mean uh, would you would you love to you know define how mars would react what is mars role in our spiritual development as a ruler of the uh four of the three asteriums of chitra dhanishta and uh, mrigsira yeah mrigsira uh, is an interesting one because it's a um, mridu or soft nakshatra and yet mars is the uh is the ruler of the nakshatra so i say that it's kind of like the iron fist in the velvet glove <laughs> <laughs> they're very nice and sweet and loving but you know if push comes to shove they can be very strong yes and, and you know that nakshatra is very much searching for truth they are they are always searching for truth and i think the mars ruled nakshatra is again there is kind of a kshatriya aspect to them as well you know because mars is the the spiritual warrior or warrioress so there's that aspect but you know Rigashira is probably a little easier to work with because it's a uh, deva nakshatra and its quality is is your is you know is more soft it has a softer quality than, than the other two um mars ruled nakshatras um, i would say um well, thinking about 
Chitra. Chitra is very interesting because it's very close to the fixed star Spica. Spica falls right in the middle of it, and that's where you know uh, Spica, Spica is. If you look at it through a telescope, it looks like a pulsating diamond. So there's a real beauty and power of. Uh, um, it's a very passionate nakshatra, and it's not just sexual passion. It can be just passion for life. And that's one of the things that I think about Mars, nakshatras, is they have to really find work that where they have a deep, deep passion and a deep love. And it's like almost transmuting the sexual passion into uh, just a passion for, for serving humanity and a passion for life mm-hmm. and their work. And... Uh, Danishka, you know, it's funny, whenever I think of Danishka, I always think of Princess Diana and how she was such a warrior in her own way, you know? Yes. In, uh, in Danishka. And uh, in that even she did the work with, uh, what was that, uh, where they did the, you know, with the landmines and things like that? In Africa. Yeah, how she was doing that work, um, you know, kind of in combat zones and things like that and going in. Uh, and just all the work that she did, uh, just to me, is, is kind of amazing in terms of her service to humanity. Um, but the Mars World nakshatras are ones that I find are a little bit more uh, challenging, uh, particularly for early marriage. Um, so they're better to get through the Mars and the Rahu yes. <laughs> So usually they'll be through those, you know, in their 20s. But uh, sometimes it can bring, bring challenge because with, with the Mars world nakshatras, you're born in Mars and then you're going to go through Rahu for 18 years. And it's kind of rough, you know, to go through Rahu sometimes unless it's well aspected, you know, early on in the life. Because, again, you're having to deal with a lot of desires and this and that. And, um, it's, so the Mars world nakshatras are... Um, I think that the beauty of them is, too, is if they can work through the early childhood issues and get through the Mars and the Rahu, then they have that behind them, and then they go into Jupiter. Jupiter. Exactly what I was going to say, that Jupiter, when it comes to them, it more than not makes up for all that they, you know, they have lost or they have missed out. So wouldn't that be a better one to enjoy Jupiter in their youth? Having, yeah. having left that... Uh, spiritually, spiritually, what would Mars teach us? Uh, Mars Nakshatra, as you said, uh, what would Dhanishta teach us spiritually? Uh, you know, again, I think it would be all three of the Nakshatras are about um, learning again to be to be assertive, to stand up for oneself, but again, to be able to control, you know, the anger, control, you know, the, and also control passion. So that the passion isn't pulling one, one out of center. So I think there's there's lessons to be learned uh, with the Mars World Nakshatras about that. So maybe it's good again for some kind of um, doesn't have to necessarily be sports, but some kind of physical uh, discipline, some kind of uh, could be, you know even something like uh, Aikido or. Uh, something like uh, Tai Chi or some kind of spiritual practice that has a physical uh, level. Yes, yes I, I am understand because that would le- work like the general that it is, right? Right. Yeah. So final one left is Venus. Uh, and we started off with Venus uh, being, uh, as you said, if it is afflicted, it raises a spiritual bar. So the Venus nakshatras of Bharani, Purva Palguni and Purva Shara. So what do they impart in us spiritually? Well, I think, again, with all three of them, there because of the Venus, there's the, the need to really, really fully explore one's creativity. Um, you know, to really go deep into one's creative nature. And um, I think, again, like we talked about, you know, sometimes our blocked creativity uh, can create a lot of problems in our life. So Barani, you know, as we were talking about that earlier, you know, is a star. It's the last really, and according to the original list, was the 27th nakshatra. So it is connected with the, the ending of life and, and uh, 
kind of going to the other side and experiencing this review that we talked about. So maybe there's some connection strongly with that nakshatra and having to go through. Also, uh, the experience of restraint. It's called the star of restraint. So sometimes a feeling of the yamas, you know, uh, of, you know, like nonviolence and, and satya truth and uh, staya non-stealing and things like that are some of the lessons that spiritually that we all have to learn. So maybe with Barani, they become even stronger the uh, yamas and the, the yoga sutras. So that was what I was thinking with that. Purva Falguni is, you know, it's in Leo and it's in this, so there is a lot of, uh, lot of tremendous creativity with that nakshatra. I think the challenge is, is that it can be very, very sensual. And so it can pull us into um, our sensory attachments. Uh, so again, maybe a working out with that is to take that energy and move it, you know, to the higher centers uh, and not just to stay, you know, in the area of sensory attachments. So, uh, you know, it's again, very creative nakshatra, especially because it's in, you know, it falls in the sign of Leo as well. So you've got tremendous, you know, creative potential with that. So sometimes music, dance, drama, theater, you know, things like that, performance, things like that are really good for that nakshatra, you know, in terms of even the spiritual path, you know, maybe that comes through dance. It may be, you know, good for the person to learn maybe some type of classical, like for example, particularly classical Indian dance, or something like that. It's more spiritualized. So taking that energy and moving it in that way. And Purva uh, Shada, you know, it's, it's a Jupiter, it's, a, it's in a Jupiter sign, you know, Sagittarius. So I think it's probably one of the more the easiest of those three nakshatras to work with in terms of spirituality, because it's dispositor of the sign it's in is, is Jupiter. So, um, you know, I have to think about that in terms of what, would, uh, you know, would be the path there. Um, I guess the study, you know, again, of, of scriptures, of, you know, uh, of the, the Vedic text and more of a Gion aspect. Hmm. And the love of study, the love of learning, the love of teaching. So that nakshatra, I think it lends itself to teaching, counseling, consulting, advising kind of work. So they may be also be sometimes interested in politics and legal affairs and wanting to, uh, to um, hopefully bring things to a higher level of consciousness. Uh, that was beautiful, a uh, very beautiful description of all the four, all the nine nakshatras, uh, nine set of nakshatras of root belonging to different planets, uh, Dennis. But which chart would you love to take up now? I'm well, that's what actually what I was just going to say was with Yogananda's, you know, to look at his chart. We already talked about Maga being so prominent in his chart, but um, he also had the sun uh, in uh, Purva Shada, you know, and so he was teacher, counselor, you know, advisor. And um, his Mercury is actually in Mula, which is a K2 ruled nakshatra. So he has, he has this, this, the rising, the moon, and the Mercury all in K2 um, ruled nakshatras. And actually even Rahu is in Ashwini. So he's got, um, he's got, you know, if we think of it in terms of the ascendant and, and three planets in K2 ruled nakshatras, the other thing is that his Saturn is in Hasta. And one of the great things about Yogananda was he wrote, he was a prolific writer. Yes. And so he, he would sometimes, um, he only lived until he was 59 years old. And he wrote, I don't know how many books, 20 books, something like that. Amazing. His writings still go on and on in terms of the, the prolific amount. But they said he would stay up until like two in the morning writing and then he would sleep for a few hours and come back up and write again because he had so much that he wanted to accomplish before he left the body you know so see maybe that's the 
the strong aspect of Saturn, you know, in Hasta, in that nakshatra. And uh, it's actually kind of an interesting little story. He was asked once about sleep, you know, <laughs> and Yogananda said, sleep, such a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> So he was a little different, on a different little level, he could go into cosmic consciousness, you know, by closing his eyes and going into Shambhavi Mudra, you know, so, but again, Saturn in Virgo, of course, is in a friendly sign, in a Mercury world sign, but that nakshatra, um, it's interesting, because Jupiter is, it's interesting, I, it'll be interesting, something will probably be released on some of his writings, because Jupiter is going stationary direct right on Yogananda's Saturn. Okay. And I find even if a person has left the body, their chart still lives on in a certain way. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this, know, this point, many senior astrologers have confirmed. I mean, I've heard it from many senior, uh, senior astrologers. Like um, we have, uh, we have Nora from, uh, you know, uh, from, Canada, she told me that Lady Diana's chart was still vibrating and she could, she could see that there was a third baby coming up yeah. for her uh, as a grandson. So uh, she, so this is, I mean, again, I find it a con, uh, confirmation. You're, you also confirm the fact that, you know, the chart still lives on. So what happens when mm -hmm. the soul takes a birth again? Hi there. Yeah, you, you just froze up just for a second. So can you repeat what you're saying about Princess Diana? Uh, so uh, I, as uh, Princess Diana's chart, it said that she would be having a third grandchild also from uh, Harry and, you know, Duchess, uh, from the Duchess. So Prince, no, sorry. I am, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, but yes, Prince William and uh, the Duchess. But I just wanted to know, if, if this continues, you know, if the chart continues to vibrate, what happens when the soul takes up a different body? How would we astrologers, uh, you know? I, you know, that to me is a question beyond my, my, uh, my grasp. But, uh, but I have found, because I've studied Yogananda's chart so much, and that the movie, when the movie Awake came out about the life of Yogananda, uh, I was doing a session for the director, uh, Paula. De Floria, and I said, "Oh, don't worry." I said, "This because you know, she was really, you know, whether that movie, an independent film, would make it or not." And I said, "Don't worry, you know, it's going to be fine," because Jupiter was getting ready to go through Leo. And Yogananda had the Moon and Leo rising, and I said, "Don't worry, it's going to really become successful." And she actually happened to have Leo. She has Leo rising in her chart too, strong Leo influence. I said, "It'll be no problem." So when that when that Jupiter went into Leo, sure enough, that film became the number one documentary film on Amazon uh, over the course of that year. And so I always thought of it was that it was Jupiter was going, you know, was going through the sign of Leo, which was Yogananda's moon and rising sign. Mm -hmm. Plus the director had strong Leo. So, you know, it, these things work out. I think that they go on. But in terms of the question you have, beyond, like I said, you know, <laughs> So I was inquisitive. I was very inquisitive, so I asked. But this is this is fantabulous yeah. to say that you know the planets still play out, and you've given a very good note that uh, Jupiter is going to go stationary over uh, Sri Yogananda's Saturn. So we might have some of his writings, or in Hasta especially, that is the reason we might have some of his work being retrieved and republished and things like that. Right. And, you know, actually, I. I heard, huh, what was it? There was something, a friend of mine who's really been involved with Self-Realization Fellowship, which Yogananda founded in, in back in the 20s um, in, in Los Angeles, uh, was saying that there were some, I should say, and, and interesting, I just remember him telling me a few months ago that there were some, uh, some of the writings that were going to be coming out. Um, oh, I know what it was. It was on, I think, on Patanjali's Yoga sutras some of yogananda's writings if i remember correctly i think it was that that some okay. some writings that hadn't been published yet okay. uh, that he had. but we'll see we'll see what how that plays for you know. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We and we do have time. Saturn would definitely again. Uh, sorry, uh, Jupiter would again go direct also over that nakshatra. So there's quite a lot of time for us to see that. Any yeah, other chart? Then is any other chart or on this chart? Um. You know, the other thing I was just looking. You know, at uh, at Yogananda's chart and. Uh, he had, it's interesting, I'll just say this, that, you know, because Jupiter's guru, you know, and of course it is connected with enlightenment. And his Jupiter was it's in the sign of Revati, in the nakshatra Revati, uh, in the eighth house in Pisces. And actually it's interesting because his guru, Sri Yukteswar, was a great Jyotishi. I always think of the eighth house as connected with psychology, metaphysics, the occult, what I mean by occult, hidden knowledge, hidden wisdom, astrology, things like that, more the path of the mystic. And uh, so it's interesting that his guru was, you know, was a great astrologer. Uh, and also that this is interesting in terms of just samadhi and Yogananda and also leaving one's body. Yogananda actually left his body during Rahu Ketu. And, uh, and he was having his fifth Jupiter return almost to the degree and his second Saturn return almost to the degree when he left his body. When he was, like I said, he was only 59 years old. So even the great avatar was still subjected to the karma connected with the planets, but it was almost just perfect precision. And he actually told some of his devotees a couple of months before he was going to before he died, that he was going to be leaving the bo his body. And uh, so he started orchestrating things, even though he wasn't sick or anything. He knew, you know, that his, his karma was, was, his time was up here on this plane. But, um, Revati is also the shepherd. Very interesting. Yes. Uh, One thing, Dr. Frawley, I'll say this too, that Dr. David Frawley told me, uh, I asked him about enlightenment once and he was saying that sometimes he found when the ruler of the ninth house is conjoined um, the ruler of the ascendant that it's very good for enlightenment and the ruler of the ninth house from the moon if it's somehow connected up with the ruler of this sign that the moon is in and then also the same with the the sun from Surya Lagna. So from the Lagna, from Chandra Lagna, Surya Lagna, if somehow the ninth Lord is associated with the first Lord, that that is a, a, a symbol of enlightenment. The other one that we've heard a lot is uh, Vimala Yoga, you know, when the Lord of the Twelfths in the Twelfth, that sometimes, especially if it's well aspected or well placed, that that can be, uh, that the person will attain heaven you know, after they leave the body, you know, attain liberation, full liberation. But to me, I'm not a guru, so I can't really claim what, uh, you know, I, I sometimes I even wonder what enlightenment really means. Uh, I, I remember one teacher said that enlightenment was a million moment-to-moment -moment experiences. But that's enlightenment. <laughs> that's a beautiful way of putting it. I think we'll take it at that. Enlightenment is is as elusive as it gets. It can be the most, it is the most elusive thing, most difficult to define and most elusive. But I like your definition of it. Millions of moment to moment experience. You know, Yogananda, his definition of enlightenment or samadhi was um, ever increasing, ever new joy. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's uh -oh. a beautiful one. So, uh, Dennis, it has been such a pleasure. It has been such a pleasure to have you and to discuss the nakshatras from an entirely different perspective. You know, uh, it's difficult to say that, Dennis, where to, I, I really do not know how to end this interview because I have so many questions, but then I know that it has to, all good things come to an end. So we're looking forward to another session from you. Over to you now, Phyllis. Well, I just can repeat all the things you said. Dennis, I, I really appreciate your gentle spontaneity and how much you've given 
our viewers to think about and myself especially Anuradha is, is a phenomenal teacher of the nakshatras and you too have very much to give all of us you know I would close too with this and I emphasized it a little bit but I would say even more um, to really tap in, in terms of each of the nakshatras, really tap in deeply to the deity or deities associated and to befriend those particular deities if they're prominent in your chart, or even when planets are transiting through different nakshatras, to honor mm -hmm. those deities because nakshatra means to guard or to protect. And they're mm -hmm. like angels that are protecting us. And so by, by befriending them, then we were able to really um, glean the, uh, the deeper spiritual truth of the nakshatras. Definitely. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm afraid I have joined Anuradha in having this long list of questions <laughs> and results from my limited research so far. But we will meet again and, and hopefully we will discuss the nakshatras again and i would like to say for from us and from sapta rishi thank you so much dennis this is really a joy and we appreciate you a great deal yeah we hope thank we will see everyone in sedona in end of november the conference. I hope I see you there so we'll see We'll Thank see. you so much. Thank sure you. Sure, we'll see you before then. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.